Dynamic Duel podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. And this is our 90th episode, and sort of the official start of the countdown to our 100th episode, for which we have something pretty special planned, so look forward to that. Yeah. Surprise teaser. Yeah. And in this episode, we're doing a dual episode, but it's a unique one. We're going to pit the Daughters of the Demon, Talia and Nissa al Ghul, versus the Daughters of the Dragon, Colleen Wing and Misty Knight to tie into our Iron Fist season two review that we did our last episode. Right. Yeah. We were trying to come up with like a good like Iron Fist related Kung Fu match. So we were thinking maybe like White Tiger versus Bronze Tiger. But White Tiger didn't really feature at all in the Iron Fist Netflix show. So we thought that a couple of standout characters from Iron Fist season two were Colleen and Misty, who, if you know them from the comics, they go by the Daughters of the Dragon. That's what they're nicknamed as. They're badass characters. We were wondering who we could possibly pit them against, because I don't think I would ever do like a solo Colleen or Misty Knight duel. Uh-huh. So we wanted to pit them together because they're better as a team. And all of a sudden, Jonathan mentioned the Daughters of the Demon, Talia al Ghul and Nissa al Ghul, who, as uh, you may know, are daughters of Ra's al Ghul, who is one of Batman's villains. He was the main villain of the Batman Begins movie. Ra's al Ghul, played by Liam Neeson, and his daughter Talia was the, I guess, head villain of the Dark Knight Rises movie. And Nissa features pretty prominently in the Arrow TV show. Yeah. So, I mean, this this is one of the more vague dual matchups that we've ever done. Obscure. It, it, if yeah. not the most obscure matchup. But, uh, I mean, definitely stick around if you don't know too much about, about these characters, because they're pretty interesting, each set of them. Really excited to get into the fight speculation and see who would come out on top between these two groups. Yeah, and their bios. We'll, we'll go over all of that later on in the episode. Before that, we're going to break down the news from the past week. We'll be talking about the Captain Marvel trailer, the first one, along with the first look at Joaquin Phoenix as the Joker. There's a new director for the Eternals movie. Mm-hmm. And there's also some like a television series coming to Disney Play that will be featuring a lot of Marvel characters. Yeah, that's, so that's pretty interesting. Then we're going to wrap up the new segment with Stargirl casting for the DC Universe. Yeah, a lot of great news this episode. Yeah. For the past few months, I feel like we've had a news drought, and all of a sudden, we have all this great news to talk about. When it so. rains, it pours. Yeah, exactly. Just a heads up that we are currently on a hiatus for the month of September on our Patreon account, so we're not producing any bonus content for that. But you can go ahead and check out our past bonus content by visiting patreon.com slash dynamic duel. And you can get access to our movie pitches and our, our blooper episodes and everything else that we put on there. Note that we do have a goal in place right now to get, reach 25 patrons, at which point we will print out physical copies of the Dynamic Duel No Prize that we award each week. So yeah, definitely check that out again. We will be resuming our bonus Patreon content again after the month of September. So yeah, definitely sign up for that. Speaking of no prizes, it's no prize time. So a no prize is an award that Marvel used to give out up until the 90s to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award that we post across our social media accounts that includes an illustration that I personally draw for those who we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week's question was, what actor have you always wanted to see in a villain role and what Marvel or DC villain would you cast them as? We have a lot of shout outs to give this episode because we got a lot of great answers. Our first honorable mention goes to Victor Mrochka. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Uh, who gave the answer of Tom Hiddleston as Two-Face. I think he'd make a pretty good Harvey Dent. He's a great he'd actor. He'd make a lot of great like comic book actor villains. He's just like, you know, just the smarmy guy. I think he would he'd do a fantastic yeah. job as Two-Face. Yeah, he also suggested Kate Beckinsale as Catwoman. Which, which has I, always been my like favorite Catwoman like fan casting. Yeah, that's definitely I would love person. to see her as Catwoman. Especially with Ben Affleck. That'd be awesome. Oh, yeah. Jacob Bell 38 gave the answer James McAvoy as Lex Luthor. We know he looks good bald. Yeah, and well, he plays a great villain in the the Split movies, so yeah, I think yeah. he'd be fantastic yeah. as as Lex Luthor. John Spees gave the answer of Michael Rooker as Polka Dot Man, which at first I thought was a joke, but then I looked up Polka Dot Man and I was like, oh my god, the illustration looks just like Michael Rooker. Yeah, Michael Rooker is perfect for that role, so. <laughs> That almost got, like, the top spot just based off those <laughs> those illustrations alone. So great job, John Spees, for that answer. He's a Batman villain. Uh, shout out to Ken Johnson for his answer of Jordan Peele as Brainiac. What do you think about that one? It's definitely an inspired choice. I think I would probably prefer Keegan-Michael Key as Brainiac just because he's a little bit slimmer, you know, and, taller. slimmer and taller. And yeah, I think he might have the look. 
I, I think it would be hard to see him play that role without being amused by it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I kind of feel like about that casting the same way I feel about Kristen Wiig as Cheetah. Like, I feel like I'm going to have a real hard time not just laughing at Because they're her. comedic actors. Right, yeah. I'm so used to laughing at them. I don't know. If, if I saw Jordan Peele, like, in the in the green skin and, like, yeah. the dots on his head. I would think it was a skit. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it might be interesting. You never know. Uh, shout out to Caleb Albers for his answer of uh, Nikolai Kostrowaldo, I think I'm pronouncing that right, as Doctor Doom. Yeah, the Game of Thrones actor. Yeah. He plays he plays a uh, Jamie Lannister. They need to cast those Game of Thrones actors in more stuff. I agree. I haven't seen them in too many other things outside of that show. I agree. And they're all fantastic actors. So Caleb also gave the answer of Jason Statham as Taskmaster, which... I love that one. Like, I, I really want to see a version of Taskmaster on screen, and I couldn't think of anybody better than Jason Statham. He's one of the top kick-ass actors of our day, so it would be For cool sure. to see him in that role. But the no prize this week, we are giving to Mr. Adam Spees, who gave the answer of Denzel Washington as Lex Luthor, describing him as both like intelligent and classy and ruthless, and he just thinks that it would make the perfect, best live-action Lex Luthor that we've ever had. When I first read that answer, I was like, oh, yeah, Denzel Washington is Lex Luthor. But the more I thought about it, especially after seeing movies like uh, Training Day, The Equalizer oh, and Training yeah. Day. Yeah. yeah. Great villain role. Just, yeah, he is that perfect mix of intelligence and intense and classiness. Yeah. And I think he would just actually nail that role right out of the park. Absolutely. Way better than Jesse Eisenberg. The question is, would he ever do it? I think he would. I think he's yeah. mentioned in interviews, like, he's just waiting for a phone call. Really? To, like, be in, in a comic yeah. book film. And, you know, he's had a shaved head a lot recently, so... Yeah, it'd, yeah. It would be perfect. I honestly. love that casting. I love that casting. And now I'm going to be disappointed if it never happens. It'll never it's happen. It's like, but, yeah. Ugh. Maybe in the next life. Oh, well. No. But, uh, yeah, congrats again to Adam Spees for winning the Dynamic Duel No Prize. If you want to win a Dynamic Duel No Prize, go ahead and stay tuned to later on this episode when we ask another question of the week. And with that out of the way, on to the news. So last week, we mentioned that we would be talking about the Captain Marvel trailer this week because we the, we knew the trailer was going to drop that right, last right. week. And it finally did, and it was you know it was it was pretty good it got me excited for the movie i liked it i really liked it did you what did it exceed your expectations it i had no expectations honestly so yeah it did i think i had slightly high expectations because uh you know ant-man and the wasp had a great trailer so did black panther so did thor ragnarok marvel's really been nailing it with their first initial trailers yeah and this one felt mostly not mediocre, somewhere in between mediocre and mind blowing. Really? Yeah. So, well, good. I mean, like, what more did you want from the trailer? You saw, like, really cool shots of Captain Marvel. And for our first trailer, uh, that's more than I thought we were going to see. So I thought that was pretty cool. You got to see her in her helmet. You got to see her, like, firing off, like, these energy blasts. That's true. I guess my main criticism of the trailer is that the character of Carol Danvers, I guess we didn't see enough of her. It was all very mysterious and vague. It and was. Frankly. It was her portrayal of the character seems slightly bland to me. Um, and that's just my first reaction. It could be entirely untrue when the movie comes out. But my fear is that Brie Larson, who mostly plays like quirky, fun, happy-go-lucky characters in the stuff that I've seen her in, at least. Yeah. I haven't seen her more serious stuff like Room or anything like that. And I'm sure she's good in that. But she's, 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 she won an Academy Award for it. Yeah. I mean, here she's playing a, you know, a type A personality, a kind of a stern character. And to me, it's coming off kind of um, characterless, I guess. That's true. She didn't really, like, emote, like, even when she was delivering her lines. Yeah, not too much. And and granted that this is just the first look that we're getting at the character, so they're not going to really reveal too much. But that was just kind of uh, an observation that I had going forward. I'm sure that the movie itself is going to be fine. I loved the way that the trailer started off. It totally brought some, like, nostalgia feels. It wasn't that cool. I was yeah. like, oh, shit, Blockbuster video. I remember going there all the time. <laughs> Do you miss Blockbuster? No, not anymore. Part of no. me doesn't, but part of me also just kind of, like, misses, you know, wandering the aisles and picking a movie just based off of the cover, you know, yeah, yeah. and then finding out that it's super shitty. <laughs> it was just kind of like an adventure. You never knew what you were going to get. But, uh... It is interesting. She So she crash lands on Earth somehow. Great introduction to the character. Young. A great introduction to the setting. Wasn't it, though? Yeah, it was a way to say this takes place in the 90s without actually having to explicitly state that. I do have to admit, though, I am super confused by the Marvel timeline based on this uh -huh. because I thought she left in the 90s. And here it looks like she's coming back from when? So it looks like she, at some point, was abducted by a Kree starship 
we see shots of her flying up into that upper atmosphere and then seeing this like alien starship kind of uncloak itself. So my guess is at that point she was abducted. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's in the late eighties. I'm guessing this is around top gun time. And I think that she actually comes back in the mid nineties as we see here. And then she probably leaves again, you know, around the time this movie ends. So she's probably only on earth for however long the setting of this film is, which is weird. It could be a week. It could be a year. She's here. She leaves. She's back. She leaves again. Now she's coming back like before and, the no, no, no. next Avengers she was here film. then she was abducted then she came back then she left now she's coming back does that make sense oh gosh if for the infinity war to fight thanos i think i could have simplified that just by <laughs> having her be here and then leave <laughs> no you have to explain her absence it, it's pretty cool to see sam jackson de-aged here looks oh, yeah. flawless it's, it is flawless like i remember seeing in the photos from entertainment weekly we were saying that you know it, it looks perfect and hopefully it holds up it with motion in, in you know in, in video and, and it, it does absolutely did there was an interesting shot here early on where it looks like nick fury is standing over an autopsy of a scroll alien and you see the doctor like performing surgery i guess on the scroll and sam jackson is standing off to the side holding this like alien looking gun hmm. i wonder what's going on there it looks like they discover the appearance of these shape-shifting scrolls on earth and maybe Nick Fury is the one who's actually looking into it yeah. when he stumbles upon Carol Danvers. The scrolls look awesome. I know we got photos of them earlier in Entertainment Weekly, yeah. but they look really cool. Yeah, I didn't really want to comment on them because I wasn't sure about their look at the time. But, uh, I mean, it wasn't bad. I, I, I thought the makeup job was actually pretty well done. And I know it came under a lot of criticism for coming across as like TV makeup which I didn't think was the case, but I wanted to hold off judgment until uh, I actually saw it in motion. And in motion, I think it's serviceable. It's, it's certainly no worse than you know any of the other alien makeup that we've seen in any of these movies. I'm not sure if they'll be enhanced with CG, but at this point, I don't think they need to. You know, no, the, yeah, the blue skin Kree certainly aren't enhanced by any means. Right. And I, I think it's perfectly fine. Yeah, so after she gets abducted, she's telling Sam Jackson that you know her backstory is complicated, we see her up in space, possibly on Hala or on some kind of Kree starship. And I don't know if they erase her memory or anything like that, because we do see that they're beaming some kind of energy into her head. Yeah, that was a bizarre scene. That was interesting. Yeah, I don't know if that's a version of the psych magnetron or if it's some kind of way that they're manipulating her into forgetting her past. And maybe that's why she doesn't remember things, because she states in the trailer that, you know, she has flashbacks of like her memories on Earth and stuff. But Something's not quite right there. She doesn't know if they're real. Right, exactly. Like the flashbacks include her going into her jet alongside Monica Rambeau's mother, Maria Rambeau. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other memories include her partaking in her military training, like doing a ropes course at basic training, I guess. Yeah, and then like her like playing baseball as like a little girl. Yeah, falling down often, but always getting up is the theme here. And the last time that she gets up in this trailer and that little montage of events is... She gets up after being blasted by this energy explosion. I guess it happens right after she gets abducted and maybe ends up on an alien planet. Something blows up, and that's how she gets her powers, it looks like, because the the power is kind of flowing from her hands. Um, So it's definitely a different sort of origin from the one that she has in the comics. Mm-hmm. she It's not like she made friends with an alien, and then he took her up in outer space, and then she became like a victim of one of his bad guys. It looks like she gets abducted, and then her body transforms through some alien means, and then she ends up joining the Kree Star Force. Well, yeah, I've heard that she's part alien, right? I think we mentioned that in the podcast before. Yeah, in the, yeah, in the comics, the Psych Magnetron machine altered Carol Danvers' DNA so that she uh, is part Kree mm-hmm. and got powers from it as a result. And uh, you can learn more about you know Captain Marvel's backstory in our Supergirl versus Captain Marvel duel episode where yeah. we go into that. Yeah. There's an interesting, the text that goes across as the trailer's playing is discover what makes a hero. Yeah. And it was kind of cool how they the, transformed her into a hero. A hero. Yeah. I thought that was really cool. It was pretty clever. Her, a hero. Yeah. It's something interesting that I'm surprised that the, the Wonder Woman marketing didn't do. Putting the her in hero. It's true. And I think it's pretty yeah. For most of this trailer, she's wearing her green Star Force outfit. It's not until the very end that we, well, we see a glimpse of her red and blue outfit, basically just her fist and her, her left leg, and she's forming a fist, and there's someone in the background that's out of focus who I'm assuming is the primary villain of this movie because I'm assuming that she gets the red and blue outfit toward the end of the film, mm-hmm. kind of like abandoning the Kree Star Force ways and kind of taking up her own identity. So 
who is this mystery person? Well, it doesn't really look like a scroll. It's someone wearing a gray outfit that has a flesh colored skin. And my fear is that they're making Marvel the villain. I don't think they would do that. I hope that they don't do that. That would really suck, and I think it would be an extreme disservice to the character of Marvel from the comics. And he is featured in in the trailer. We do get to see him. That's right. pretty cool. Yeah. He has crazy eyes. They're like yellow. Yeah. So the final shot of the trailer is is the money shot. It's of her coursing with all of this photonic stellar energy. Yeah. It's a pretty cool effect. That was the kind of the thing that I was most curious about regarding this trailer was how they were going to portray her energy powers. And it's kind of like this mixture between fire and electricity. It's kind of hard to describe, but I'm pretty pleased with how it looks. Yeah. I think it looks pretty cool. I think it looks unique from all the other energy manipulation we've seen from Marvel heroes, such as Iron Man's, you know, repulsor beams or Thor's lightning or something like that. I think what makes this look pretty cool is like the flares Yeah. that you see. Like a feathered kind of flare. Yeah, the camera flares kind of. I, th- I think that's a pretty cool effect. But that's pretty much the trailer. Again... I think the biggest thing I'm concerned about is maybe Brie Larson's performance, which is a little bit unfounded really on my part because we haven't seen enough of it. to. And she's a fantastic actress in general, so. Yeah, I shouldn't be making that decision because she is fantastic and and I hope she does really well here. Yeah, looking forward to March 2019 when it comes out. I'm looking forward to next October when the Joker movie is coming out. (laughs) So we got our first look at the Joker. It was released by Todd Phillips on Instagram. Yeah, super creepy. It was super creepy. (laughs) And of course, I'm I'm referring to him in his makeup. The the other photo of him without his makeup, we've already talked about in the last episode, but uh, the makeup debut was very interesting. Yeah, I like the video that was the reveal where it's Joaquin Phoenix, I guess, doing a a makeup test. They called it a camera test, but I I don't think it really was. I think it was purely promotional. Right. Because it was acted, basically. Yeah. Where Joaquin Phoenix is standing in the room and uh, he smiles as the projector is going over him of the Joker in clown makeup. Exactly. So it was, you know, it was planned. Definitely. It was just random flashes of the projector image that we got, though, kind of going over him. And it kind of reminded me of the projector scene from It. That's exactly what it reminded me of yeah and that's sort of what the final look reminds me of in a way uh, a little it, bit yeah to me it's, it's like a mixture between it and like heath ledger's joker and like john wayne gacy yeah that's an apt description it's a more of a traditional looking clown makeup style yeah and i know like there are a ton of people who hate it and t- to me I, I don't think they understand that this is a joker origin film to me this is not joker makeup this is clown makeup well, he is a clown in the movie who later becomes the Joker. Well, th- right? That that's not that's not confirmed. He's he's a failed comedian. We know that. Ultimately, though, I I don't think this is again Joker makeup. To me, this is clown makeup. To me, this is sort of just him becoming the Joker. And I think Warner Brothers is going to make us pay to see the final Joker makeup at the end of the film. The version that's perhaps not makeup is what you're saying. Perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But I'm betting for the majority of this film, he's going to be in this clown yeah. makeup and that's going to be this film's version of the Joker. And I'm, I'm totally fine with that. Yeah, absolutely. I think I am. It looks I mean, like it's going to be a pretty cool film. I'm really liking what I'm seeing so far for an Elseworlds tale. You know, I, right. I think a lot of people are like, Oh, this movie is set in the eighties. Wonder Woman, 1984 is set in the eighties. Have a crossover, you know, have, have Wonder Woman show up in this movie or vice versa. No, but I really do not want them to do that. Like the reason this project appeals to me is because it is separate from any shared universe. It's an Elseworlds story, just like the great Elseworlds stories in the comics. Exactly. Which I think is in part why I'm looking forward to this movie more than I have said that I have been in the past, because it looks like it's shaping up to be pretty good. And also, I mean, like in a a shared universe, Joker, you don't necessarily want to know his origin. Exactly. Exactly. But in this Elseworlds universe, it's interesting to kind of explore what the origin may be. I mean, why not? You know? Yeah. So one of the reasons that Todd Phillips said that he's releasing some of these photos and stuff is because of all the paparazzi that's around as they're filming. Yeah. And we got to see more set footage from paparazzi of the Joker exiting the subway train and a whole bunch of people are leaving it and they're carrying signs and wearing yeah. clown masks. And yeah, a few of them are wearing clown masks and they're beating up Thomas Wayne, played again by Brett Cullen. And they're just attacking him and they're holding signs. I guess he's running for mayor, Thomas Wayne. Yeah. And they're calling him a fascist and a clown. It's really interesting. I have no idea where they're going to take this story. Yeah, it's interesting that the whole clown thing could be more of a political statement than anything else. Right. What does make me somewhat worried about this is how much 
older they're going to be making the Joker than Bruce Wayne. That's a good point. Yeah, because in this movie, he'll be about the same age as Thomas Wayne. It depends on how old Bruce Wayne is when his parents are killed, I guess. Because if he's like, you know, 12, 15, and this Joker's, I don't know, maybe in his early... Late 30s. Late 30s, early 40s. Oh, geez, I don't know. I don't know. I I think he could play like late 20s. I mean, it, it does kind of ruin the potential for a franchise stemming off of this, I think, because of that age gap. Which is a good thing, again, because this is an Elseworlds tale, so just keep it isolated. Yeah, you're not going to see Batman in this film. In this version of the universe, maybe Joker is much older than Batman. Yeah. You know, it's possible. It could happen. Yeah. What did you think of the parallels that people are drawing between this behind-the-scenes footage and The Dark Knight? Where in The Dark Knight, the opening scene with the Joker was him pulling off a clown mask to reveal Uh, clown makeup underneath. That's exactly what he does in this footage where Joaquin Phoenix removes his clown mask to reveal clown makeup underneath. Well, I mean, I guess, I mean, to me, his whole look is very much based on Heath Ledger's look. Yeah. You know, it doesn't surprise me. This whole thing looks very inspired by The Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so, I mean, it's it's a strong parallel for sure, but it's not the same scene. It's definitely not going to play out in the same way. Do you think it's an homage to The Dark Knight? Or do you think they just don't care? I think they want to use a version of the Joker that people are, are familiar with and really liked. I think they feel that that's going to make them a lot of money. A good way to draw comparisons to a movie that was hailed, basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's not their most original thing, but you got to do what you got to do, I guess. Again, yeah, you're right. It's not the same scene. It'll be an entirely different movie, but kind of set in the same tone as The Dark Knight, perhaps, which might be pretty interesting. Which might be fantastic, because I loved the tone of those films. Yeah. Yeah, we'll see what happens uh, regarding further, like, leaked footage and stuff like that. I hope they don't reveal, like, too much leaked stuff, because I, I, know. I almost feel like this scene right here was actually, like, a spoiler. Where yeah. You, where you see them beating up Thomas Wayne. Exactly. Stuff. I was very disappointed when I learned that that was Thomas Wayne on the ground. Like, what if this is the last shot of the movie? I don't want to know that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to see anything else. Paparazzi, just chill the fuck out. Yeah. Just stay away. Let us be entertained when the movie comes out and not spoiled. Right. Yeah, I got to be really careful with the marketing from here on out. As a matter of fact, we, we probably shouldn't look at any more like leaked stuff and just stick to like the official stuff. It's hard. <laughs> it's really hard to have the willpower to do that. Yeah. I think ideally, you know, they're, they're trying to stem the sort of spoilerish nature of everything that's being leaked by leaking their own stuff, you know. So we'll continue to comment on that. But I think I'll try and avoid, you know, the the paparazzi footage from here on out. Yeah, that's probably a good idea. So in other news, Marvel has hired Chloe Zhao to direct their Eternals film, which uh, was revealed by The Hollywood Reporter to be a story focusing on Icarus and Cersei, a love story between the two, which Hmm. uh, I thought was pretty interesting news. Now, I have no idea who Chloe Zhao is. She has directed just a couple movies, including The Writer and Songs My Brother Taught Me. Haven't heard anything about those. But, you know, Mar- Marvel's been making some pretty great choices, finding, like, untapped talent. If they say that Chloe Zhao is a great director, then I'm inclined to believe them. Now, regarding the story with Icarus and Cersei being a love story, that's interesting to me because... They've had a relationship in the comics before, but Cersei is not really one to kind of commit. She's kind of a very hedonistic character, shall we say. I don't know anything about her. When you say Cersei, I just think of the Wonder Woman villain. Oh, so Cersei is an Eternal. The Eternals are a race of beings in the Marvel Universe that were created by the Celestials, who are like these godlike aliens that came to Earth to to seed life, basically. Right. And the first life that they seeded were the Eternals and the Deviants. And then later on, when the Eternals left Earth and the Deviants went underground, they created humankind. Mm-hmm. So there, there are two kinds of Eternals. Well, there's multiple kinds, but the two main kinds of Eternals in the Marvel Universe are those that stayed on Earth. And their leader was an Eternal named Zurus. And the Eternals that live on the planet Titan, which is where Thanos is from, their leader was named Mentor. So it's like two different groups. Like Thanos belongs to the group of Eternals that left Earth. So the ones that stayed on Earth, like Icarus, like Cersei, they kind of grew up to become mythological beings who live among us. So in the comics, these Eternals characters are living among mankind as superpowered beings. But is that something that we really want to see 
uh, in this current timeline, huh. them living among present day heroes when they're not helping out the Avengers and stuff like that. I think I would like to see from this movie is it not actually take place in the modern day, but be more of like a period piece, like way back maybe in ancient Greece or even prior to that. Really? Yeah, where we see them influence mankind and really shape the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and perhaps even plant seeds to the forthcoming introduction of mutants in the Marvel Universe. Yeah, I keep hearing that rumor. Yeah, so like have this start out with the Celestials, give the history as it is in the Marvel Cinematic Universe with the creation of the Earth and the Deviants and the Eternals, but also introduce the concept of mutants, like the genetic potential for mutants, and just have this movie be more of a history love story. History of the planet Earth. History of the planet Earth in the Marvel Universe. I could totally see that because we've heard stories of them unfurling the timeline scroll of the MCU during meetings and stuff like that in yeah. production. Yeah. So, yeah, they obviously have the history written down. So maybe, yeah, that's what this is. Yeah. Like it, the modern Marvel Cinematic Universe really dates back to about World War II, maybe just a little bit before that. Or prior to that, we don't know a lot of what happened. And, you know, in the comics, a whole lot happened. And I think this is a great opportunity to explore that while not damaging your current timeline and also expanding your universe. Hopefully they go that route. The characters of Icarus and Cersei themselves are pretty interesting, although Icarus, his power set is very similar to Captain Marvel's. You know, it's basically strength, energy manipulation, and flight, although he has some psionic abilities. He can teleport and stuff like that. All Eternals have the same powers. They just kind of like specialize in a, in a particular area. Like Cersei, she specializes in matter transmutation. So that's her power. To me, this is just competition for Avery DuVernay's New Gods film. Maybe. Yeah. It may they're going to be even, coming around at, like, at the same time. It may even be competition for a DC Superman film if they ever decide to do another one. Because Icarus, I think, is, is pretty similar to that Superman archetype. You know, he shoots lasers from his eyes, strength, flight, you know. Hmm. So we'll see what happens. But uh, yeah, speaking of Marvel's expanding universe, they are expanding into the television realm with their Marvel Cinematic Universe actors in a new series that's going to be introduced on the Disney Play app that's coming out next year. Which means we called it. We totally called it. Well, a a few episodes ago, one of our questions of the week was, what kind of Marvel content do you want to see on the Disney Play streaming app? And I think it was Dan Baker who said that he wants to see like Marvel Cinematic Universe spinoff shows regarding characters that we wouldn't see in their own solo films. So I guess Dan Baker called it. (laughs) It was basically an anthology series for Marvel characters in the MCU. Yeah, and we said they should call it like Marvel Spotlight or Marvel Studios Presents or something like that, kind of paying homage to the comic series that used to do that. So, I mean, we don't want to take credit for uh, coming up with this idea or seeding it in the Marvel execs' minds, but, um, you know... If you want to give that to us, I'll take it. I'll take credit. We, we will. We, we'll take it. Or I'll at least hold on to it for Baker. Yes. <laughs> so I'm excited about this. I think this is a great opportunity to really expand the universe so we don't have to, you know, wait so long in between Marvel movies. We can get that fix pretty frequently. It's a really cool way to tell stories that you normally wouldn't have been able to tell. On the big screen. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. The rumor, according to Variety, is that they're going to create a, a Loki miniseries as well as a Scarlet Witch miniseries. Both characters who I think would be fantastic, uh, if not in their own movie, in their own television show. Yeah. There's a lot of depth to these characters that we haven't seen and we likely won't get to see outside of a team-up movie. And it's just not those two that they'll be doing a limited series of. They haven't announced any of the other characters, but there's going to be a lot more, apparently. Right, yeah. I want to see a Vision miniseries. I want to see a War Machine miniseries. I want to see a Falcon miniseries. And I want to see some, even some lesser characters who I won't reveal at this time because that leads us into our question of the week. What MCU character do you most want to see get their own limited series on Disney Play? And which particular storyline do you hope to see them adapt with them? Yeah, post your answer to our Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, or you can email us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com. And we'll pick our favorite answer and draw that person a Dynamic Duel no prize that we'll post to social media and mention in our next episode. Just the last bit of news real quick. Uh, Breck Basinger. Basinger? Basinger? Has, is she related to Kim Basinger? I don't know. I'd like to think so. I don't know. It's not a common last name, so you would think. Yeah, maybe. Uh, she's been cast as Stargirl for the DC Universe app. 
Stargirl is actually a Jeff Johns creation, so it kind of seems like he's pretty close to this character. It's based off of his sister who his died. His sister who died, yeah, when she was a teenager. Right. If you're not familiar with Stargirl, her real name is Courtney Whitmore, and she's essentially a legacy character based off of uh, Starman. Yeah, she has the cosmic rod that once belonged to Starman, right? Yeah, it's essentially the story of a girl who, you know, her mom marries a new guy, and that guy ends up to be the former sidekick of Starman. Okay. So she steals some equipment, and she becomes her own superhero just to, like, kind of rebel. But I guess in this series, the way they're describing it is that she goes on to, like, inspire other teen heroes. Like the Teen Titans? No, they're describing them as the Justice Society, which are not young teen heroes. If anything, they're the opposite of that. Exactly. They're old codgers. Um, (laughs) But I guess in this show, they're going to be young. Oh, that's weird. I think, if I'm interpreting that correctly. Mm. Because it says that she's she's inspiring an unlikely group of young heroes, the Justice Society of America, to stop the villains of the past. So there will be a time travel uh, component to this. But then then later on, it says that she becomes the unlikely inspiration for an entirely new generation of superheroes. Well, that might make sense because JSA is all about the legacy of the characters. So, you know, the older characters are retiring and being replaced by the newer characters. So you might have the two generations of the JSA there. Oh, true. Which which could work. That could totally work. What's weird is that Stargirl has already appeared in the Legends of Tomorrow television show, which is part of the Arrowverse kind of timeline, which I thought these DC Universe shows were a part of. I, I don't think that the DC Universe shows are part of the Arrowverse. Okay. That kind of sucks. It kind of does. I guess you could always retcon it to say that The Legends of Tomorrow are not just exploring time, but they're also exploring maybe other dimensions or something like that. Parallel universes, perhaps. I guess you could. but Or you could just say that it's just a different part of the multiverse. There you go. There you go. Like Supergirl and the Arrowverse, essentially. Okay. Or I guess Black Lightning, I think, too, is his own thing. Gotcha. Some of the first comics I got were actually of Stargirl. They were were given to me. I forgot who gave them to me. but Stars uh, and Stripe. Exactly. Her own title, Stars and Stripes. She's not the most interesting character to me, honestly. Really? But I'm I'm definitely going to check out this show. I like her more than any version of Starman. Although Jack Knight was pretty interesting, but I think, right. she's, more, I think she's more interesting. Than Jack Knight? I, I don't know. I think that might be blasphemy in a way. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, if Jeff Johns is really into it, then I'm sure it's going to be a, a big priority for, for DC Universe to get right and, and for it to be good. Cool. So, yeah. That's good. I think that's it for all of the news. Let's move on to the duel segment where we pit the Daughters of the Demon against the Daughters of the Dragon. Let's go. So the Daughters of the Demon, as we mentioned before, are Talia Al Ghul and Nissa. Ratko, or sometimes referred to as Nissa Al Ghul. Right, the daughters of Ra's Al Ghul, the Batman villain. Exactly. And I can't remember how I came across these two to pit against the daughters of the dragon. I think it was basically I was just looking for daughters. Uh-huh. And I was like, uh, who, who, who are some daughters that are like badass like ninjas with swords? Fucking daughters of the demon. They're not actually referred to that in the comics. Uh-huh. But Tali has been referred to as daughter of the demon before. Mm-hmm. Of course, the demon referring to Rachel Ghoul, which translates as the demon's head. And actually, Rachel Ghoul's first appearance in in the Batman comics was in a storyline titled Daughter of the Demon. Oh, yeah, sure. I remember seeing that on a cover. Um, and Misty and Colleen are not actual daughters. They're not siblings, as you know. If right. you watch Iron Fist season two, you know that they're just best friends who were given the moniker Daughters of the Dragon uh, just because they're badasses. But they do have comparable like skill sets to Talia and Nissa Al Ghul. I'm assuming because they're both great fighters. They're both highly intelligent, and I think this is going to be a, a pretty damn good matchup. It might be the first time this matchup has ever been done, honestly. Yeah. Because I think most of the duels that we have are, are pretty popular fan matchups for but the most part. I don't know if anybody's thought to pit the Daughters of the Dragon versus the Daughters of the Demon, so it'll be fun to kind of explore this for the first time. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Um, if you're a first-time listener to our podcast and you're not familiar with the way we do our duels, they're all stat-based, essentially. Yeah, that's how we determine the winner. We compile each character's stats 
and then run them through 1,000 simulations uh, to come up with a percentage of wins for each character. And we do this using the probabilistic model known as the Monte Carlo method. Right, it basically takes their stat and plots it uh, on a bell curve among a standard deviation from which uh, we compare the results, and uh, that, that basically determines everything. Right, and because we do so many matches, we do a thousand matches, it just lends to the accuracy of the results, of the percentage of wins that we end up with. Right, because the Monte Carlo method is used uh, practically in a lot of different applications in real life, such as, you know, risk assessment, video game AI, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, and the reason we do it this way is we are both extremely biased. <laughs> so there's no bias in the results. There's no fan votes, no uncharacteristic feats of strength, just science. Yeah. And somewhat official in that we take our stats from the official Marvel power rankings. Right. And uh, we also extrapolate the DC stats from those. Uh, we do add some additional stats of our own uh, that we think are important to any particular battle. It just depends on which matchup we're doing. Yeah. But before we run the simulations, what we like to do is kind of speculate on a scenario between the two fighters, or in this case, the two groups of fighters, how we think a fight between the two would actually play out, because we think it's fun to do. Yeah. yeah. We also go into each character's history, and that's just to help understand the character's abilities and their backstories, in case you're not familiar with them. Right. So uh, I'll go ahead and start off with the backstories and abilities of Colleen Wing and Misty Knight, a.k.a. the Daughters of the Dragon. Now, Colleen Wing was born in the U.S., but was raised in the mountains of northern Japan by her grandfather, Kenji Ozawa, who instructed her from an early age in Bushido, the way of the samurai. As a fully trained adult, Colleen returned home to New York City, where she learned from a monk that the Iron Fist would soon be arriving, and was instructed to seek him out and offer assistance in taking out the Karakai Death Cult. After that mission, Colleen was saved from criminal gunfire by police officer Mercedes Misty Knight. The two became best friends. Misty grew up in New York City, where she trained in the police academy, graduated with honors, and became a highly decorated lieutenant in the NYPD. One day, she attempted to defuse a terrorist bomb at a bank, and although she was able to save the people inside, the bomb exploded and took her right arm. Unable to continue active duty as an officer, she was given a desk job and fell into depression. However, Tony Stark recognized her act of heroism at the bank and granted her a bionic prosthetic. Misty left her desk job at the NYPD and formed a private investigations firm alongside Colleen that they named Nightwing Restorations. It was Misty's kidnapping by a villain named Bushmaster that first led to the series of events that introduced Luke Cage and Iron Fist, a duo that would later form a team called the Heroes for Hire. Nightwing Restorations would often team up with them, helping them take down villains such as the Golden Tigers, Bushmaster, and Steel Serpent, who was the first one who dubbed Colleen and Misty as the Daughters of the Dragon, huh. a nickname that stuck. They were major players in picking up the slack after many heroes disappeared after the Onslaught saga, fighting crime and keeping the streets safe in their absence. After the eventual dissolution of the Heroes for Hire, Colleen and Misty took up work as bondsmen slash bounty hunters. During the Civil War event, Tony Stark asked them to reform the Heroes for Hire and get paid to track and detain those acting outside the Superhero Registration Act. They agreed, provided they only go after criminals in violation of the Accords. Hmm. They helped Daredevil defeat the Beast and the Hand during the Shadowland event, after which it was revealed that Colleen's mom was the leader of a group of the Hand called the Nail, who were a group of female swordsmen. After her mother's death, Colleen became their leader in an effort to steer the group toward righteousness. Meanwhile, Misty briefly led a new incarnation of the Defenders that consisted of all female superheroes. This was before both Colleen and Misty reunited to assist the latest version of the Defenders team, which included Daredevil, Luke Cage, Jessica Jones, and Iron Fist. As far as abilities go, the Daughters of the Dragon are both exceptional martial artists, both trained by Danny Rand in addition to their prior training, Colleen in Kenjutsu, Judo, and Aikido, and Misty with her combat training at the police force. Colleen studied with Iron Fist in how to focus and channel her chi, or life energy, to use it as versatilely as a human possibly can without having the power of the Iron Fist. Going into a zen state, she can perform minor feats of strength, accelerate her healing speed slightly above normal human levels, and withstand extreme temperatures. She carries her grandfather's katana everywhere she goes, passed down from generations of samurai. Misty often carries a pair of handguns, and with her bionic arm, she has increased punching and gripping strength, though not increased lifting strength. 
It's made of diamond interlaced with Antarctic vibranium. What? Which, as we discussed in the Black Panther duel, is different from Wakandan vibranium. Instead of being a metal that absorbs vibrations like the Wakandan variety, Antarctic vibranium emanates vibrations at a specific frequency that breaks down the molecular structure of most metals. In addition, she recently received an upgrade to her arm that can fire force thrusts to blast back her opponents. Both Colleen and Misty are expert detectives among the best analytical minds in the Marvel Universe. And that's them. Diamond and Antarctic Vibranium. That's a weird combination. It's pretty ballin'. I didn't realize it was developed by Iron Man. It was initially developed by Iron Man. Danny Rand has made some upgrades to it uh, in the past. Right. But uh, yeah, it's not like the television show where it was donated by Rantcor. I'm not afraid. Okay. Sounds like you are. No. <laughs> I would say uh, Nissa and Talia are probably closer to Colleen than the Misty, uh-huh. but uh, we'll see. We'll see how this plays out. Yeah, Colleen is more of a samurai type character, whereas Misty is more of you know she carries guns and has that prosthetic arm. They kind of complement each other. It's kind of like the past means future. They're like a yin yang of personalities and and abilities. I guess that's cool. Talia and Nissa aren't really yin yang because on their own they're sort of like these perfect whole specimens. Okay, you know, and then we have two of them. Uh-huh. Um, let me get into their backstory. <laughs> so, the story of Nissa and Talia al Ghul begins with their father, Ra's al Ghul, the demon's head, the 500-year-old leader of the League of Assassins and one of Batman's most challenging adversaries, first appearing in a 1971 issue of Batman titled Daughter of the Demon, Ra's is able to heal, revive, and resurrect himself in natural underground chemical pools known as Lazarus Pits which has resulted in his prolonged life and allowed him to develop over the centuries into the most resourceful and dangerous criminal mastermind on the planet, Mm -hmm. an eco-terrorist intent on mass genocide of the world's surplus population. Sometime in the 1700s, during his travels through Russia, Reich had a daughter named Nissa Ratko, whom he abandoned. Yet Nissa's mother regaled her with romanticized stories of her father, and when she was older, Nissa set out to find Raish and eventually tracked him to the League's secret base in Northern Africa. Impressed by her ability to find him, as well as her beauty and warrior spirit, Raish accepted her into the League of Assassins and trained her to become his right hand and eventual heir. She followed him in his crusades to cleanse the earth and at one point suffered a fatal wound. Raish used one of his Lazarus pits to save her, an honor he rarely bestowed on those in the League. Over a century had passed, and Nissa eventually became disillusioned with her father's genocidal mission and parted ways. Unhappy with her decision, Raish nevertheless let her leave, even granting her her own Lazarus pit, believing she would one day sire a more worthy heir for him. Huh. Nissa did have a family and was happy living in Europe, though she refused to hand her daughter Hannah over to Raish, causing him to disown her permanently. Not too long after this, Nissa's family was captured by Nazis in World War II and tortured in concentration camps. Nissa underwent cruel experiments that made her infertile. Raish visited her in the shadows, but refused to save her or her family, because while he disagreed with Hitler's ideology, Raish recognized that the millions who died from Hitler's actions would only aid his cause to thin the population. Nissa's husband and daughter died in the concentration camp, Mm. and she survived only because she was able to make it to her Lazarus pit when the war ended. By the late 60s, Raish met his new wife, Melisandre, at Woodstock, and the two later- Yeah. What? And the two later had a daughter named Talia. Talia's a Woodstock baby? Yeah. So they had a daughter named Talia, whom Raish, like Nissa, trained to become his right hand. In the Daughter of the Demon storyline, Raish emerged inside the Batcave and revealed to Batman that he knew his secret identity as Bruce Wayne, and explained that both Robin and his daughter Talia had been kidnapped. Batman managed to rescue both, but the whole thing turned out to be a ruse set up by Raish and Talia to test Batman's worthiness to be Talia's husband, as she had fallen for him. Huh. Though Batman rejected their offer to become the leader of the League of Assassins, he did express shared romantic feelings for Talia. Subsequent years showed Talia conflicted in her loyalty to her father and her beloved Batman. 
Batman and Talia were at one point married under League rules, at a time when Batman was helping Raish track down Talia's mother's killer. They consummated their marriage and she became pregnant, though she faked a miscarriage after Batman became more interested in protecting her than bringing her mother's killers to justice. Interesting. Their son wouldn't be born until years later in an artificial womb. Angered by Batman's continued rejection of his empire, Raish chose Bane to become Talia's new husband. You can learn more about Bane in our Bane vs. Iron Fist episode. Yeah. Talia rejected Bane and eventually, like Nyssa, rejected her father and his crusade, changing her name to Talia Head. She became the CEO- It's a horrible last name. It's kind of like a James Bond uh, yeah. girl's last name. <laughs> She became the CEO of LexCorp when Lex Luthor was elected president of the United States, and she eventually sold Lex's company to the Wayne Foundation after his fall from presidency. By this time, Nyssa had reaccumulated her wealth and developed a plan for revenge against her father Raish, who was slowly dying as Batman and Bane had been destroying Lazarus pits around the world. Hmm. Talia, who was unaware of Raish's other daughter, was befriended by Nyssa, before Nyssa drugged and kidnapped her. Talia was taken to Nyssa's Lazarus pit and killed over and over again, each time resurrected by the pit. The horrifying ordeal broke Talia mentally, and Nyssa brainwashed her into hating Batman and killing their father. In their confrontation, Talia faltered and Raish ended up running a sword through her. Batman rushed to save her, and because of this, he was unable to stop Nyssa from driving a dagger through Raish's heart. Wow. Nyssa escaped with Talia, and together they took over the League of Assassins, a result that Raish apparently had planned all along. He planned for his daughters to kill him? But he planned for Nyssa to take over his crusade and the League. Gotcha. So together the sisters tried to assassinate Superman using kryptonite bullets stolen from the Batcave, in an effort to destroy the world's hope, in the same way that hope had been destroyed for Nyssa in the concentration camp. Batman, however, was able to stop them. During the Infinite Crisis storyline, Talia rose through the ranks of the secret society of supervillains, achieving authority over almost every supervillain in the world, with the intention of joining their forces with Nyssa, now referred to as the Demon's Head, to fulfill their father's legacy. That plan was stopped in part thanks to Cassandra Cain, whom you can learn more about in our Batgirl vs. X-23 episode. Mm -hmm. Nyssa was assassinated soon afterward in a car explosion set up by Lady Shiva, after which Talia assumed full control of the League, later resurrecting Jason Todd in a Lazarus pit and birthing her and Batman's son Damien, the new Robin. Unbeknownst to Talia, Damien's body was intended to become the new host body for Ra's al Ghul's soul, but Talia was able to save Damien from that fate. Raish did return, however, as a zombified corpse and was eventually rejuvenated by a mystical fountain of essence. Nyssa and Talia have no powers, but both are trained assassins and master martial artists. They're also both weapon experts, particularly in the art of swordsmanship. They're both tactical geniuses, especially Nyssa, who has the added benefit of having lived for centuries. Talia, on the other hand, has technical knowledge, having several science degrees, including in engineering. I'm surprised that Nyssa is older than Talia, because I thought Talia was the older sister. No, but no. not only was I wrong, I was like way wrong. Way wrong. Because Nyssa yeah. is like centuries old. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. Hearing that backstory just serves to prove how good of a matchup this is, I think. Yeah, I think so. And uh, so, yeah, let's go into how we think a fight between these two groups will go. What we do with these speculations is set a few ground rules in which the characters know nothing about each other, but they do know that they are threats that need to be eliminated. Yeah, we usually start them about 50 yards apart from each other, and we don't account for the environment in any way. It plays no factor in neither our speculation or the stats, because it's too big of a variable. Right, some characters could win in one environment and lose in another, so... We like to keep this as neutral as possible and say that wherever these characters are fighting, the environment plays no factor. Right. So let's go ahead and get this started then. Uh, 50 yards apart, Misty and Colleen on one side, Nissa and Talia on the other. Uh-huh. Who goes first? Okay, well, I want to start off by, let's put all the guns on the table just to see what uh, everyone's carrying. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good idea. 
Nissa and Talia, I mean, fighting style wise, they're they're both really similar. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they they both had the same teacher. When they were in charge of the league, they both definitely had swords on them. So they're both going to have their own like scimitar kind of style swords. Scimitar, okay. And they're both going to have daggers located in maybe some hidden places. Okay. And then maybe guns. Talia definitely has a gun. Talia does? Yeah. Nissa may not. Uh, I'm going to say she doesn't. Okay. Colleen will definitely have her sword. And Misty will have a pair of handguns. And her bionic arm. Colleen will also have the use of her chi. All not, right. not to the extent of the iron fist, you know, but she can increase her strength for, for blows in so much as a human being can. I do think that Talia could probably come to this fight more well prepared uh, if she knew that it was going to happen. Um, she well, could probably be as you can say that about as, anybody. I know as equipped as almost like Batman is, but uh, I, I do think I'm, I'm just going lit, to limit them to again swords and to what's typical. Yeah, gotcha. All right, so let's go ahead and get this started. Colleen is going to unsheath her katana from uh, its sheath, and Missy Knight's gonna pull out both of her guns from their holsters on her on her side. Okay, so Talia and Nissa are both like, so these are the weapons that they have. Good. <laughs> Okay, um, so they're not going to pull out their weapons? No, they're going to keep them kind of hidden, but they're going to charge the daughters of the dragon. Okay, so at that point, Missy is going to start shooting at both Nissa and Talia. And she's an expert marksman, so she shoots both of them in the head and the match is over. Okay, no, no, that's not what happens. <laughs> they both dodge out of the way because they're both, like, expert, agile gymnasts as well. Uh-huh. They're very agile. They're okay. perfect human specimens. But Nissa, she takes the lead and she starts attacking both of them with her sword, both of them at the same time. Oh, so they close the gap at this point. Yeah. Doing their flips and shit. Yeah. And so as Nissa is, is distracting them, that's when Talia comes up behind Misty and starts examining her arm. You think Misty is just going to like let her do that? Well, no, she's not going to let her do that because she's too busy fighting with Nissa. Nissa's fighting with her sword? Yes. Okay. So while Nissa swings her sword at Misty, Misty blocks the sword with her arm and melts the sword down, effectively rendering Nissa swordless. It liquefies. She no longer has a sword. Uh, except that this sword is made of Prometheum, and it doesn't do that shit. Uh, yeah, it does. Why? It destabilizes the molecular structure of the Prometheum. Yeah, maybe Marvel metals, but not DC metals. I mean, it does it to adamantium. It does it to the strongest metals out there. So yeah, the sword is melted. What the shit? Yeah. Okay, well, then as Misty is melting the sword, before she can melt it too far, that's when Talia realizes what's happening, and she stabs Mi- Misty in the side with the dagger. Oh, shit. So Colleen sees this, and she rushes Talia, and those two start sword fighting while Misty's dealing with her wound in her side. But she still has her gun, and Nissa is without a weapon. So she starts shooting well, at Nissa has, like, a slightly melted sword, but she, <laughs> she could still totally be lethal with. Okay. She well, could be lethal with a lot less than that. All right. Well, anyway, she's getting shot at regardless. Okay. okay. So Nissa's like dodging the bullets and she's trying to get in close with her knife, which Missy melts down even more to nothingness. <laughs> no, no, no. As Missy is trying to shoot Nissa, that's when Nissa like kicks the gun out of her hand, turns it on her and starts firing at her. But before Nissa could get off a shot with Misty's stolen gun, Misty uses the magnetism powers in her arm. She can, like, pull metal toward her, which is something what? I neglected to tell you. Sorry about that. Oh, okay. But she can of do course. <laughs> She pulls the gun back into her hand so that she has control of the gun again. Ah, oh, crap. And then continues firing at Nissa. Damn it. <laughs> well, then, uh, okay. I mean, so Nissa still has her own gun, too, so she's firing back. Oh, um, shit, it's a gunfight. So, yeah, they're yeah. both, like... These gunfights are the worst. <laughs> That's what made the Red Hood versus Punisher fight so hard, is because they're basically shooting at each other while also trying to dodge the bullets. Right, right. <laughs> it's just horrible. So that's what they're doing. They're, like, kind of, like, rolling and diving and shooting. Meanwhile, Colleen and Tali are having that sword fight, but at some point, they come swords together, and they're, like, pressing against each other, and that's when Colleen focuses her chi into her hand for the strength and cuts through Talia's scimitar. <sighs> okay, then uh, Talia pulls out some surprise weaponry. These uh, smaller... I thought we had all weapons on the table. Th- you, t- These are ninjas. You don't know where they're going to pull weapons from. I-, I guess I did pull the thing with the magnetism. Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. All right. Uh, like mini scythes, like uh, Kama, I think they're called. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. And these things are like made for taking on swords. Okay, so she's battling Colleen with that. Okay, 
Oh, that was convenient. Yeah, it was. All yeah, right. it was. All right, so so okay, so Talia has these twin comma weapons, which are like billy clubs with with sickles coming out one end. Colleen, she she's able to defend herself against the comma pretty well. Okay, okay. Meanwhile, back over with Misty and Nissa, they're still shooting at each other. Right. But I have a pretty good idea that Misty could deflect bullets with her magnetic arm. So maybe that's not the best route for Nissa to go. Nissa cheats as well. She pulls out what? a collapsible bow, bow and arrow. Okay? And she I know we're cheating after this. She pulls out some Does she use that often in the comics? She, she uses it all the time in the Arrow show. So it's a bow and arrow versus a gun. Right, exactly. She pulls out some like collapsible arrows too from her boots. And she just <laughs> Fires, these aren't metal, by the way, just okay. to let you know. She fires off a few rounds at Misty, and some of them hit her in key points in her... No, because before the arrows could even hit Misty, Misty shoots out a force blast from her arm that shoot the arrows back. Well, fuck! <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, so then Nissa like, tucks and rolls, and then, like, from the low point on the ground, she, like, flips over Misty, and with the wire of her bow, she starts strangling her. Oh, that's a pretty good move. Okay, so Misty, using her martial arts skills, reaches back and grabs onto Nissa's leg and then crushes and breaks her ankle with uh, her increased grip strength on her arm, thereby forcing Nissa to uh, relinquish the... No, Nissa's used to pain. If she crushes her ankle, she's still standing on Misty's back with one foot, and she's still crushing her throat with that cord. Okay, well, then Misty just reaches over and grabs the other leg and then shatters that one as well. Except that Nissa sees that's happening, so right when Misty reaches for her leg, that's when Nissa lets go of the bow, and it slams into the back of Misty's head, and it dazes her, and now she's on the ground dazed. All right, so Misty's dazed, and Nissa is hopping around with one shattered ankle. Let's go back to Colleen and Talia and see how they're going. So they're fighting with the Kama and with the swords. Okay. Okay, so as they're fighting, Talia catches Colleen's katana in her blades with, with with the two sickles. Oh, by crossing them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then she just uses her strength to pull on the comma and break Colleen's blade. Oh, shit. Are all the swords in this match gone now? Yeah, I guess they are. Okay, so, but Colleen still has, like, a half a sword left. Okay. So she can still do some damage with that. But she's like, ah, crap, my sword's broken. So at that point, she looks over and she sees that uh, Misty is dazed. And she sees that, like, Nissa is, like, coming up to her with, like, a knife about ready to stab her, okay. hopping on one foot. Okay. So she throws her katana, her half a katana, and it spins, and it sinks right into Nissa's other leg, her good leg. Oh, gosh. <laughs> so Nissa's, like, both of her legs are, like, paralyzed now. Okay. So as Colleen was distracted doing that, that's when Talia, like, sweeps her leg under Colleen makes Colleen land on her back, and then just drives the, the comma right into Colleen's, like, upper torso. Oh. Meanwhile, meanwhile, Nissa is, is Nissa, falling down onto the ground. Nissa she is drops on the, ground. The, the knife that she was going to use to stab Misty. Uh -huh. Misty picks up that knife and then hurls it at Talia, and it gets her, like, right underneath the chest. Is Misty good at throwing knives? Yeah, Misty's good at throwing knives. Okay. So now um, they're, like, they're all fucking busted. But that seems like a good place to stop because we have Nissa who has a shattered ankle and a half a sword in her leg. We have Misty who's still dazed from the heavy tension in Nissa's bow. And it was still somehow able to perfectly throw a dagger into Talia. Yeah, well, I mean, that's what she was able to do. She's, you know, it's just muscle memory by this point. Oh my gosh. Talia has a dagger in her and Colleen has a comma blade in her as well. Yeah. So let's take it to the simulations and find out which group of femme fatales walks away from this. Cool. So as you may remember from our Cloak and Dagger versus the Wonder Twins fight, when you have multiple characters involved in a fight, you're not just comparing sets of data, you're comparing matrices of data. Right. So it, it lengthens the processing time by like quadruple almost. It yeah. It takes a long time. Yeah. We just can't account for like mono y mono. You have to consider each character going up against every other character. Right. So we get win percentages for all of that data. Right. And then basically we just average the team numbers into one number that we can compare against the other team number. Yeah. So we're averaging each person's wins into a total team score. Right. Exactly. And this one was actually 
pretty close, I think. A lot of the stats were comparable. Um, I think both Colleen and the Al Ghouls are slightly better fighters than Misty, although Misty is exceptionally trained, so only marginally sh- so. Yeah. Uh, Misty definitely had the most kind of, like, damage output potential. Yeah, she definitely made up for Colleen's lack of a firearm, which kind of hurt her in the stats. Yeah, she, uh, Colleen didn't have much range. I mean, she can throw her sword, but that, that's not typically something that you would want to do with a katana. She would be doing, right, yeah, she'd be using it more hand-to-hand against the Daughters of the Demon swords, basically. Right. So. so because of the way we do this, I'm the one who compiles the matrix data. Yeah, usually um, I and, give the results. And yeah, the I, I have the results right here. So uh, are you ready to hear them? Well, y- yes, I am. Yeah. Either way, I'll be interested, but I really hope that Colleen and Misty win this one. Okay. It was a really close match. So the winners of the thousand matches between the Daughters of the Demon, Talia and Nyssa, against the Daughters of the Dragon, Colleen and Misty are the daughters of the uh, demon. Really? Yes. They won uh. 540 of the thousand matches, and Colleen and Misty won 460. That's n- not bad, but it's the other way around, right? I mean, Colleen and Misty should have won 540 matches. Not according to the stats, sir. Not according to the stats. Well, what was the major disparity between these two? Why is it... Uh, I think it's that... Colleen lost against both of the Al Ghul sisters. That's right. And Misty won against both of the both of the Al Ghul sisters. Right. But I think the percentage of wins that the Al Ghuls had over Colleen was not enough to overcome the amount of matches that Misty had over the Al Ghul sisters. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Damn it. The Al Ghul sisters won a little bit more than half of their matches, whereas Colleen won about a quarter of her matches. Okay. Fuck. All right. Well, I mean, it was a good matchup either way. I, I really think that uh, it was pretty interesting, not only in our speculation, but to see the stats play out the way that they did. That was a lot of fun. And, you know, despite them being obscure characters, I hope you guys learned a lot about them because I certainly did. Yeah, it and, was uh, fun. I'm was glad we did this match because I'm not certain, you know, again, when else we would have done it, if not now. With those characters. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, yeah, that does it for this episode. In next week's episode, we will be doing another dual match yeah. between... Clayface and Venom. And this is in preparation for the Venom film that comes the week after. Yeah, which we will be reviewing when that comes out. I'm really looking forward to this next match. That Yeah, it should be a good one. Clayface is totally going down. Uh, don't be so sure, sir. I'm just looking forward mainly to the next episode for the Venom curb stop that is going to happen. And by that, I mean Venom is going to be curb stomping. That's not how I interpreted that. <laughs> All right, but yeah, look forward to that next week. And in the meantime, go ahead and visit our website at dynamicduel.com where you can listen to previous episodes of this podcast. And if you do, please, uh, please rate, review, share, or subscribe. All of those things help us out, specifically when you rate us on the iTunes platform because our goal is currently to get to 200 ratings on iTunes so we can become official Rotten Tomatoes reviewers for these Marvel and DC films. Yeah, that would be amazing. And honestly, like if you have a, you know, a spouse or a friend, friend or a family member who has an iPhone with a podcast app, just steal their phone, just go to our podcast and give it five stars. Yes, please. Because Honestly, every time we ask for iTunes reviews, we get like maybe one that week. So uh, just just do your part now and we can stop asking so much, <laughs> I guess, is the thing. If you if you just rate it now, don't have to rate it again. And also, as you steal their phone to rate us, also make sure to tell them to listen to us as well. Oh, yeah, that'll be, that would that'd definitely help as well. <laughs> Especially if they're Marvel and DC fans, I, I would hope that they would be entertained by this show. Yeah. So yeah, also on our website, dynamicduel.com, you can also find links to our social media platforms. Yeah, as well as our merch store, where we sell t-shirts and mugs and a whole bunch of other different items with our no prize illustrations on them. Right, yeah, it's pretty sweet if I do say so myself. Definitely check that out if you get a chance. And yeah, that does it for this episode. We look forward to talking to you guys again in a week. Up, up, and away. True believers.